Hi everyone, Louis here from Spitfire Audio, and welcome to another One Orchestra video. In these videos, we take a look at everything relating to our BBC Symphony Orchestra libraries, breaking down pieces of music created with any version of BBC SO, as well as sharing some tips and tricks and our inspirations along the way. We've launched our very own forum to allow you to share your BBC SO creations for us to listen to, and if you make sure to tag your pieces either on YouTube or SoundCloud using the hashtag One Orchestra, there's a possibility it will be showcased in the closing segment of this video, so do stick around for the end to listen to some stellar works from the community. Now this is a bit of a different video, I'm joined by our very own Lou Colney. Now you started off at Spitfire as part of the customer experience team, but you've now transitioned into a developer role. You may have seen Luke appear in the background of some of Christian's vlogs, with a particular highlight being when you had your makeup done for picture day. But no, the real reason we've got you here today is because you've written an incredible demo in Cubase uh, using the BBCSO Pro edition of the library, uh, around the time it launched, so let's go ahead and have a listen. cracking bit of music Luke. When we start writing these these demos we usually have briefs or a bit of inspiration so was there anything in particular that kind of inspired you to write this bit of music? Oh yeah absolutely it was mainly 90s film score like I think about things like Forrest Gump so composers like Alan Silvestri, uh, James Horner. Uh, I mean with this one in particular I was listening to a score by someone called William Ross uh, and the score was My Dog Skip which kind of inspired the name uh, man's best friend but uh yeah it's uh it's very kind of I'd, I'd even go as far to say it's quite simple and almost like cliche in a way but it's the good stuff from the 90s i think like if you listen to forrest gump it's so simple mm -hmm. and uh that was kind of the structure i was trying to follow here really so keep it simple but keep it interesting uh through orchestration decisions and things like that yeah. so i can see you've opened the start of the piece using a lot of strings and you're predominantly using a lot of um sort of leader patches and is there any particular reason behind that yeah, absolutely. Now the leaders, I guess a lot of people think initially when you see leaders, you think of soloist and you just use them exposed like that. But I really like to use them as a layering tool because it kind of brings in a bit of a, a soloistic expression to it. But as well as that, it really helps with the, the transitions and this, the way that it sounds in terms of realism. So we can actually have a listen to those as well. So if I just solo the leaders uh, at this intro and just play that. So by itself, it's, it's not actually that much, but as soon as you layer that in with the section, this is what it sounds like. Oh, nice. 
And then if I take them out again, just to show you what it's like without those, you'll just hear the detail that they're adding. It's subtle, but it makes a big difference. Like, you can hear that right away, I mm -hmm. think. And it's just a really nice way of sort of bringing the strings a bit more detail, a bit more focus, uh, and just helps with the, the realism overall, I find. You know, other than using just the leader patches, what else have you done to kind of help make this sort of whole string section sound a lot more realistic? Well, it's, th it's that thing with samples, isn't it? I think with samples in general, when they're exposed, they're, they're prone to sounding more samply. It's, it's just uh, the nature of samples. So it's, it's about how you approach using the samples, like layering with leaders, but also even just bringing in the woodwinds here. So we've heard those now with just the strings, but as soon as I solo the woodwinds as well, it just adds another texture to it, which helps to sort of push it to that higher level. So as well as that, I've also used uh, a lot of CC1 and uh, CC11, which is expression. So CC1 is uh, the mod wheel, as, as you probably know. But uh, essentially, this is where the real realism kicks in, I find. So you kind of try to phrase things as a string player would, using them in combination as well. So you can see here, this is uh, the CC1 data, and you can kind of see at the end of the notes, there's slight tail offs, things like that. Uh, but if we compare that with the expression, which is essentially, when you think about it, is just volume. So you've got to be careful with it. You don't want to overdo it, but just use it to sort of help the phrases. So what I'll do now is show you an example, maybe with and without expression, and we'll see what that sounds like. Okay, so this is with expression. And this is with expression all at the top. So this is more static expression. You can hear the difference it makes without. Yeah, I can see you using the expression in combination with the sort of dynamics or, or the mod wheel it really helps kind of give each passage in your in your piece a lot more movement. And yeah, kind of, absolutely. I don't know, a bit more of a human feel, I guess. In a way, when you think about it, it almost enhances the dynamic range a little yeah. bit and it just helps you to phrase things better, which is really important because you've, you've got to kind of think when you sample an instrument, we're, we're asking for almost like, not necessarily static, but an expressive, consistent note. And it's up to the person that's programming it to to bring in the realism. And that's where CC1 and CC11 come in. Moving on past, this is just the intro here, but let's move on to the introduction of the first melody here. So this is actually the, the first part that I wrote. Uh, and it's, again, it's kind of following that simplistic structure. So I'm trying to keep the melody as simple as possible as well. And that sounds like this. It sounds sort of lullaby-esque, almost like it's sort of belonged in a Disney film or something like oh, that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think that was the whole intention with this as well. I mean, I used the, the Labs music box, which yeah. is kind of perfect for that, that lullaby kind of sound. Uh, and that's in combination with the, the Celeste there as well. Kind of just adds a bit of a dreamlike quality to it. It's very subtle, but uh, I'll play that quickly just by itself. And then if I just add in the music box. Nice. That's that's straight straight out of a lullaby, isn't it? That kind of thing. So you mentioned this section was what you sort of initially started out writing before the introduction. So how did you do that? Did you start uh, with the strings or with that kind of lullaby melody? What did you write it on? So I usually try to sketch things out with piano. Sometimes it doesn't work out so well and I find that I'm just hacking away with the strings and things like that. Yeah. But I do think that, especially when it comes to melody writing and things like that, having a piano in front of you, it's like the full range it's, it's just easier to get that down. It's exactly the same with me as well. Piano being my main instrument, yeah. I, I tend to kind of sketch things out on piano as well. Yeah, absolutely. So in the case of this, uh, it's, it's such a simple melody, it really is. But if I just play the melody by itself. Mm -hmm. 
So that's how it start, started out essentially. And it's kind of just, I find like with the simplest melodies, it's really good if they kind of follow uh, almost the the harmony that you're using. So in this, it's literally just based around C major, you know that. You can just, you can hear it straight away. And then as the melody develops uh, to the second half of the A melody, it, it's just A minor. Uh, and also when it's the first time you're hearing a melody as well, I think it's really important to, to make that the simplest representation mm. of it. So don't get too complicated with maybe the orchestration or even just like adding counter melodies and things like that. You know, keep the first statement as simple as possible and then develop it in the second statement of the melody. So at this point, we can we can move a bit further along and just listen to the, the introduction or the reintroduction of the strings here. Uh, so let's just play that. And I'm actually just gonna solo the strings by themselves at this point. Here, there, you've decided to use sort of a lot of legato patches, and what's the reasoning behind using legatos as opposed to maybe longs or a different articulation? So legato, I think if you're going for anything towards realism or some form of convincing mock-up work, I, I feel like legato is always going to be the go-to, just because that's the the intervals between the notes essentially. And with a longs patch, you don't get that, uh, whereas in reality, obviously, you do. So you can actually hear the players moving between the notes, and that's just adds a whole new level as well. And that's something you don't get with the longs. Longs you tend to use maybe more for more, I guess, harmony work, building up chords and things. Absolutely, and even just more like pad-like work I can find. And it depends on the writing, really. But as this is strictly quite melodic in nature, I think that uh, legato is, is the way to go. And that uh, honestly, uh, if I look at the, the project itself, almost all of these, uh, all of the woodwinds are legatos, the brass as well, and the strings, of course. And there are some other things going on, but we'll, we'll get to that further down the line. So at this point, the, the strings have been reintroduced and it's kind of important. So I'm moving into the second statement of the, the first melody, but I don't want to just bring the strings in at that point. So this part here was really just acting as a, a way of slowly reintroducing the strings. And then we get to the, the statement, the second statement of the first melody. So I can hear that same melodic theme again, but this time you've transferred it into the woodwind. Absolutely. So this is the whole thing with, uh, we've already stated the melody once uh, in its simplest form. So we get to state it again and, and make things a bit more interesting, really. So I moved the melody over to the flutes, but also more in the woodwinds. Uh, and as well as that, the strings are taking more of an accompanying role. Yeah. And also even the the music box and the chalice, they're kind of, you know, they were the state, the first statement themselves. They were the, the lullaby and now they're still there. And they're kind of just doing this arpeggiated. So adding a little shimmer kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that just adds, it kind of keeps it consistent. So I'm not getting rid of them and dropping them completely, but it just keeps them in there uh, and kind of stays consistent to the first statement, despite the fact it's still developing, basically. Yeah, I think in this sort of second instance of this this main melodic theme, you can really hear that kind of Disney inspiration now, especially with all the kind of orchestra uh, working together. Absolutely. And it's actually funny you mentioned because the next part, so after this statement, it moves into kind of the part that's directly influenced by Mencken, which is most of the Disney stuff you hear. And this is kind of that classic question and answer thing that you just, you hear it everywhere, but uh, I think it's really, really common in the Disney stuff. <laughs> So in that instance, you've got the the strings asking the question, and then you've got the the woodwinds and the brass answering, and it's kind of like again, like I said, that simple Disney stuff. So if I were to play it, it's kind of like, or similarly something like this. You know that that classic question and answer thing. Yeah, I mean it's a really lovely call and response between your strings and your woodwinds there. Yeah, and I think you can kind of get away with two different things with this kind of call and response stuff. So you can either change the range, so you can start in a lower range and then uh, the, the answer would be in the higher range. Uh, in this instance, though, I, I just changed the orchestration. So the range is kind of around the same 
uh, but we've got the strings again and then the woodwinds are answering so it's just it keeps it interesting because you're just changing the sound of it yeah i mean i feel like you putting that response in the woodwinds i don't know about you but it feels a lot more intimate as opposed to kind of the whole string section taking that yeah absolutely and that kind of leads into the next section as well because it's bringing it down a lot so having the woodwinds they always sound quite exposed and you know they're soloist instruments as well so it kind of helps to lead it into that next section So at this part, I actually had a really hard time trying to decide which instrument should take the melody. So if you think about it, I've already had the strings take a melody and then I've had the woodwinds. And I remember trying on this part, I, I, sat, like, I was trying the clarinet, English horn, and it's like it's just not working. It just didn't feel like enough of a different colour. Uh, and I find this is really useful as well. Like I was listening to Field of Dreams, which is a James Horner score. And there's this part halfway through uh, and the orchestration to that is kind of exactly like this. And I, I think it's just so useful to, to listen to something and just pick up on orchestral devices that work. And uh, so in this case, he actually had a, an acoustic guitar playing this melody. And I was like, OK, to keep this consistent, I'm going to actually do it in the Celeste as well. And it, it worked like so the rest of the orchestration here, the tremolo strings and the, the pizzicato bass and the harp. Uh, that's all very inspired by Field of Dreams. And I think you can even listen to it. I think it's called The Place Where Dreams Come True. Oh, don't quote me on that. But uh, about halfway through that piece, uh, there is, you'll just basically hear the inspiration for this, for this part. Yeah, that's something I wanted to pick up on as well. It's because you've got a, you know, an individual instance for each kind of instrument, um, but you've not split it between articulation. So it seems to me like you've been using some key switches here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, key switches are... It's a workflow preference thing. I don't tend to use them too much. Uh, I tend to prefer to split things out by tracks, but it's, it's really a personal preference thing. But in the case of this demo, I did use key switches. Uh, and what it's doing really essentially, I can actually just show you. Let's have a look at the basses, for example. So I've got, uh, let's find the note. They're always at the bottom of the range, the key switches usually, or actually no, on basses, <laughs> they're up there. So obviously out of the instrument's range. And what we've got here is that's just the long, and then that moves, that key switch there is triggering the pizzicato and the basses, which I can actually show you. So you're just switching between articulations while remaining on the kind of same uh, MIDI track. Absolutely, yeah. So it stays on the same track and you use a key that's out of the range and you see all these green notes up here. Those are the key switches essentially. Uh, and I can actually press them now and you'll see that it's just by clicking through those, it's changing the articulation. And that's, uh, that's the benefit of key switches, keeping it all on the same track. And it means that you don't have to split that out. So again, because we're now introducing the B melody, so we've already heard the A melody, we've heard it restated. Now in this section, we, we're hearing a new melody. So at this point, uh, again, it's back to the simplest statement. I, I don't want to just overcomplicate it straight away. This one is just based in the, the relative minor of the piece. So the piece is in C, minor, uh, C major, sorry, uh, and this is A minor, which is the relative minor. Uh, but let's just play that melody quickly. So at the end of this section, I've actually, again, there's a real directly inspired part from uh, Field of Dreams, which is like the cello run, where the cello is just sort of moving up the range. And that leads into the, the sort of the climactic part of the piece, and that just introduces that. So uh, let's just go ahead and play that from here. So because, again, this is the second statement of the B melody, but it's also the climax of the piece, I've kind of brought in everything here. So this is like every family. We've got the woodwinds doing stuff. We've got the brass, which actually hasn't had that much of a role so far as well, the brass. It's really just been a supporting role. But at this point, I've, uh, I've kind of brought it in and it's doing some more stuff, a bit of a counter melody and things like that, working with the strings. So uh, let's actually solo out the brass. And you'll note this, the CC stuff and the brass as well, it's all very similar to the strings. You don't have to really follow many different rules in that respect. Just pay attention to how the instruments work, really. And if you listen to enough, 
uh, even just film scores or just general orchestral music, you kind of just naturally develop your ear to hear what they sound like. Yeah. And that's the best advice I can give in getting it sounding convincing. So let's go ahead and play that now. And I actually think that that is, uh, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, I think it's the violas and the cellos that are working with the horns there. So I'm just going to solo those together and see what that sounds like. So that part is actually moving between the violas and the cellos. So the horn initially is actually playing what the violas are playing and then it moves to what the cellos are doing later on in the phrase. I think that's what's good about this library as well is because you can have sort of orchestral libraries for separate uh, sort of orchestral sections. But with the, the BBC library, we've obviously recorded all the plays that, that work together, interact together. So it's very kind of seems quite seamless to blend each section together yeah cohesive it's, it's so easy and that's the, the good thing about this as well you don't have to fight the library it, it does just all slot in together which is exactly what you want when you're trying to write something like this really like i found that it came together really well and even in terms of just the balance like the orchestral balance so just playing things in i didn't have to mess around much with that it kind of it came together really nicely and i think that's a huge bonus of the library you mentioned as well in this sort of i guess closing a big kind of grandiose section of the piece that you've brought in sort of pretty much all the orchestral families together. I noticed a bit of a symbol there. And I could even make out a little bit of the glockenspiel um, oh, yeah. twinkling away. Yeah, so that, that the celeste and the glock at the end here. Now, this is actually interesting because it's so subtle, but this is one of those things that I think it's subtle, but it makes a big difference. So if I just solo that, actually, let's just do the celeste there. And you'll hear it. So again, it's just a similar to earlier, just an arpeggiated phrase. But uh, I'll show you with and without and see if you can hear the difference it makes. And then if we add everything back in, just try and listen out for that. Like it's, it's really subtle, but it's there and it's just adding a bit of a, a shimmer behind everything, which again, it keeps it consistent with the earlier stuff in the piece, but it just, I love that kind of thing in a big clim climactic part to have that kind of texture. It carries the whole kind of theme of it being sort of a lullaby, even though it's this big orchestral section. Yeah. Um, you've got that kind of running through. I also noticed a bit of a harp and a piano going on there as well. Yeah, yeah. So actually, if I solo all of the percussion here, this will sound quite quite interesting, but it's going to be a very, very different vibe to what you hear with yeah. everything in. Uh, it is, it's interesting. I mean, even though it does sound very different, you can still hear that kind of core of the piece in there. I suppose that comes from sketching it out on a piano first and then building it using using the orchestral sounds. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm a big fan of consistency. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to sort of lose the listener. And that's what, again, keeping it, the whole piece is so simple, but it's so easy to lose the listener still. Uh, so the, the whole purpose is like an exercise in just keeping things interesting despite it being simple. And that's what those those guys like Sylvester and Horner were masters at, really. Uh, you look at their writing and it's it's very simple, but it's so engaging, I find, at the same time. Uh, and that's you can hear the inspiration in that. So with that played out, we can now actually move to the end of the piece. And it goes back to that kind of that break part. So there was that part with the question and answer earlier that we heard. And that was the, the part that kind of separated the A and the B sections. So I think it makes sense to to have that again at the outro basically and that's what I did here. Here you're bringing back the call and response at the end of the piece there. Yeah, absolutely. Though there is one change on that, actually. 
uh, I think earlier in the piece it was the strings asking the question and the woodwinds answering, yeah. right? But because this part, it just had the sort of the big part of the piece and it was very, very string heavy, uh, it kind of wouldn't make sense to have the strings asking the question again. So I actually mixed it up and the woodwinds ask a question and the strings are answering this time. Uh, just keep, again, it's for the sake of keeping it interesting, essentially. I feel like it sort of neatly ties a bow on it all because you started off with the strings and it's kind of come full circle now, ending with the strings kind of giving that answer and that final really lovely chord. Oh yeah, for sure. And this whole piece is really, really string heavy. Like I think uh, they're kind of prominent throughout the whole thing. Uh, there are There's plenty of melody in there. There's c- counter melody as well. But really that's just consistent to that style, I think. Yeah, you'll hear a lot of strings in those 90s film scores. So I feel we've been through every section of the piece now. Is there any more advice you want to give in terms of kind of programming for realism, anything you want to look at uh, in the session as a whole? Yeah, I mean, a big one is this thing at the top here, the tempo map. So actually, let me just open that up. Uh, and this is, it looks pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> what's going on here? But this stuff is so, so important. Uh, so there are some tempo changes throughout the piece, but it's these bits that really make the difference. These dips at the end of the phrases. So actually, if we just go back, We'll just play it from here and just play it, seeing as this is the most jarring to look at, this part here, you'll kind of hear what the tempo mat's doing. And you can even look at the bottom here, the change of tempo, it's constantly changing. And that kind of just helps to kind of keep it like it's a performance, really, you know, that someone's conducting it. Uh, it can be a bit of a trap to fall into keeping things consistently one tempo throughout the whole thing. Uh, and that's kind of the difference here, at least with orchestral music anyway. Uh, so let's just play from this bit here and you'll you'll see what that's doing. It seems like all these little changes are very kind of quite slight in terms of using, uh, you know, a little bit of expression and dynamics and having changes in the tempo mapping. But it all adds to that kind of real human performance Um, and using those legato patches as well. It really helps phrase things really nicely. Yeah. And that's the dream for me uh, with this kind of stuff. This is the stuff that I get a bit obsessed over. And, you know, you can be sitting at home in your pajamas writing for an orchestra, basically, (laughs) on your computer. And I think that's just a really cool thing. And again, this library is just great for that. Just having access to all of these instruments and that cohesive sound. Again, it shows you don't have to write kind of a really ridiculous kind of melody that's going all over the place and, and having all sorts of different articulations popping in and out. It's, it's Like you said, it's very simple, but it, it really kind of almost tugs at your heartstrings through how it's programmed and, and how you've conveyed that realism with it. Yeah, and, and again, I, I do really just think that's important to be able to do that stuff. I think it's quite easy to jump jump through hoops and go into the complicated stuff straight away and overwrite. But if you can get the simple stuff done well and develop it well, that carries over into when you're getting to some more perhaps complicated writing. And just uh, your ability to be able to do that is if you get the simple stuff right, it's a lot easier. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on in terms of maybe the mix or, or the mic signals that you've used? Yeah, I mean, we can have a little look at the the mics choices in this. So there was quite a few decisions I made. I think I wrote everything with mix one initially, and I thought that was that was sounding great. There were some changes that I wanted to make, uh, not so much in the strings. The strings are all mix one, if we just have a look. Yeah, so as you can see there, it's literally just mix one. Though I will say, I got some of this going on, uh, the spill, which was really, really cool, like a really cool feature to this library. And that's something you only get in the in the professional edition of the library. That's right, yeah. So if you're using Core, I think you just get Mix 1, don't you? So to get access to the other mics, it is the professional version, yeah. So let's just have a look at maybe the woodwinds. So you can see here, I've also used this tool here, which is really cool, the Techniques Editor, just to get rid of everything else. You know, once you've finished a project, you can just really bring the RAM down <laughs> if you just get rid of those. Uh, but looking at these, so we've got the, the Decca Tree there, and then Mids, which is probably my favourite mic for woodwinds by far. They're not too close. I don't like woodwinds to be too close, like in your face. Uh, and the mids are kind of like a mid distance uh, between the room and the close mics. And that's just, it's a really nice pickup uh, to use those on woodwinds. And then looking at the brass, one thing I love about this room, Made Avail, where this was recorded, is it has such nice depth to the room naturally. And I kind of just, with the mics, uh, it was all about the width. Uh, so I've gone for the outriggers here. The tree is a lot further down. If we go further along, we've even got some sides in there, which are like literally right at the side of the room. Uh, But it's just all about the natural width with this stuff and even some balcony in there. And of course, spill. 
that's about it. So you've got mix one on the strings, taking that. Uh, you've got the the width, natural width from the mics on the brass, uh, the mids on the woodwinds, and as for the the percussion and the mallets and things like that, that's all mix one as well. But there, uh, yeah, that wraps it up really. Oh, thanks, Luke. It's been great diving into your whole piece there. I've been quite flattered by some of the comments people have said over this one. Hopefully, there's something in here that's useful to someone that's watching, and uh, great if so. Now it's time to show off some of your creations you've shared using the hashtag One Orchestra. Let's have a listen. First up, we've got a brilliant demo by Takanori Ujima using BBC Discover and Piano. Next, check out Jonah Marvin's brilliant BBC core piece titled Leaving Forever. Now we've got Owen Baldwin's BBC SO Pro piece, Remember the Rose. This one really takes you on a journey. And finally, we finish with Forest Mischief by Jell Proust using BBC SO Pro. What a remarkable piece.
you'll find all the full pieces from these fantastic composers linked in the description below, as well as a link to Luke's full piece and MIDI. As always, we love listening to your music, so definitely get involved by tagging your BBC SO pieces with the hashtag OneOrchestra, as well as uploading them to the Spitfire forum for a chance to be featured on upcoming videos. Give us a like if you liked, and let us know what you want to see covered in future videos in the comments below. As always, download the Discover edition of BBC SO if you haven't already, as well as our monthly labs instruments, so you can start creating music today. It's free. And that's everything. Cheers for sharing your piece, Luke, and I'll see you in the next one.